Um, right, so, uh, and then another quick one. Uh, this is an interview, in fact, with a man called John Graham Cumming. Um, people may have heard about him last year when he managed to finally extract from the British government an apology to uh, Turing, who, uh, a, a, a brilliant mathematician, who killed himself um, Oh, decades and decades ago after running afoul of uh, Britain's then anti-homosexuality laws. Uh, it's a terrible story. Anyway, and John Graham Cummings' new project is to build one of Charles Babbage's analytical engines. Now, these are the size of a small steam train. It was a mechanical computer uh, that was designed sort of, well, over 100 years ago during the Victorian years. And, and this, if it had ever been built, uh, would have basically catapulted um, England into the computer age 100 years early. Now, Babbage was a fascinating character. He was a complete genius. Uh, he's also the guy behind the differential uh, engine. People may have heard, of, uh, or heard about it or seen pictures about it. Um, but <laughs> fantastic. And, and so much as he was very charming and a great host and things, he was, he was also known for being very, very difficult sometimes. So sometimes his machines didn't get built because, frankly, people didn't like him. He offended them. <laughs> and there's a wonderful story. Um, Babbage once contacted the poet Alfred Tennyson in response to Tennyson's poem, The Vision of Sin. Babbage wrote, In your otherwise beautiful poem, one verse reads, Every moment dies a man, every moment one is born. If this were true, the population of the world would be at a standstill. In truth, the rate of birth is slightly in excess of that of death. I would suggest that the next version of your poem should read, Every moment dies a man, every moment one and one sixteenth is born. Strictly speaking, the actual figure is so long I cannot get it into a line, but I believe the figure one and one sixteenth will be sufficiently accurate for poetry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, one of the original pedants. You've got to love it. But <laughs> but looking at, at these engines that he built, I mean, the, the, the number of gears, they are so complicated. So you, one can imagine that he would have had to be, well, slightly pedantic even to be able to design these amazing, amazing machines. Um, cool. Talking about amazing machines with lots of whirring little bits, this week in Nature Nanotech, and as some of our listeners probably already know, I'm slightly in love with Nature Nanotech, um, <laughs> they actually published a review. So it's their five-year birthday. They published their first issue in 2006, and at the time they noted uh, that their very first editorial piece said... Uh, depending on who you ask, nanotechnology started in 1981, 1974, 1959, or the Bronze Age, <laughs> and the potential market will be worth 2.6 trillion in 2014, or 1 trillion in 2015. Um, obviously, a lot of confusion there about what nanotechnology actually was, what it actually is. So they've published a review, and they've managed to pull out over the fast over the uh, four main topics that nanotechnology research has followed in the past five years. Uh, these areas are DNA nanotechnology, so this is using DNA to build things, mm -hmm. and there are some really cool developments there. Graphene, which we've already mentioned a couple of uh, episodes ago. Nanopores, which is an article and topic very close to my heart, seeing as it's <laughs> what I spend my time in the lab investigating. And nanotoxicology, which is another really big one we're just coming to grips with, and there's still a lot of... Um, research being done and needing to be done about the safety of nanotech particles. So they, they've they got four different websites that they've put up giving a really good simple reviews of all of these four topics and um, they're well worth having a look at. Got some really, really cool pictures as well mm -hmm. and then they finish up with a list of the countries um, that are most prolific in nanotechnology publication and it's interesting. Singapore is at the top of that list. Wow. And just the growth rate of nanotechnology publications is amazing. Um, the, the field is certainly proliferating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> exactly. Oh, cool. Well, that's that's definitely something to go and have a look at. Now, another two uh, quick pieces. The first is that if you're interested in Mercury, the uh, planet, um, Mercury is very much in the spotlight this last week. There have been a number of papers published in Science this week. So everybody's sort of all a Twitter, as it were, um, and Nature's been writing about it as well. And basically, Mercury is a very, very, very strange planet. Now, NASA's messenger spacecraft uh, entered orbit around uh, Mercury in March, and it's been returning all kinds of interesting data. There are some really strange uh, rock formations 
on on Mercury that are confusing the hell out of everybody, um, and and just also the um, the the environment is so so very 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 harsh. But we don't know very much about Mercury. In fact, messenger researcher David Blewett is quoted in Nature News as saying Mercury is weird. Everything about it is weird. We don't know what kind of rocks it's made of. We don't know its color, and it's not depleted of volatiles like everyone had thought. And uh, some of the new research and some of the pictures that are coming back basically look like Mercury's innards are, are leaking out through its surface and things. So very strange. Some great papers, some fantastic pictures. Go and have a look. And the other one is a piece written by Ben Goldacre, um, known for writing the Bad Science column. And this is actually, this is kind of terrifying. He looks um, at a paper which came out in Nature Neuroscience in the last, oh, a little while ago. Um, what he's calling a mighty torpedo, in which these researchers have identified one sort of direct stark statistical error that's so widespread that it par uh, that it appears that about half of all of the published papers that they surveyed, and they looked at hundreds of them in uh, academic neuroscience research literature, it looks like this error is being made over and over and over again. Now, he goes on to basically explain what it is, and people are claiming statistical significance basically where there isn't any. Um, now, that is a problem. And he says, look, there could be a couple of reasons for this. Maybe it's just incompetence. Maybe, however, you know, there's the classic thing. If, if you don't have a positive response, it's, it's difficult to, well, a positive result, it's difficult to write papers and go to conferences and, and have, everyone, have everyone look up to you. So <clears throat> certainly worrying. But, of course, the great thing is now that this error has been identified, perhaps future papers will, will be making it an awful lot less. <laughs> One would hope so. One would. <laughs> Going back to space for a moment, the next article we picked up from the Register in the UK uh, just got new images, uh, new data rather, back from the surface of one of Saturn's moons, a little fella called Enceladus. It's quite similar to the uh, moon called Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter rather than Saturn, but essentially all that means is that it's a very, very icy moon. Enceladus got quite a lot of press recently because it has these weird plumes all over its surface. It has these icy volcanoes, so yeah. they know that there's some kind of heating mechanism inside of Enceladus, and they've seen this on other moons as well. It could be a consequence of being so close to Saturn, or it could be a few other things, but the end result is that they have they have these uh, icy, powdery plumes all over the surface. Mm. It's moon, so the moon has gravity, and the ice settles back down to the surface in very, very fine particles. And what's interesting about this particular article is that it notes it would be the perfect size to go skiing on. So ignoring <laughs> the fact that you would freeze and you would explode and all these other horrible things would happen to you if you weren't in a <laughs> spacesuit, um, if you were out there, you'd have a great time of it skiing around on the surface of Enceladus. It's apparently, yeah, it's got perfect powder, basically, <laughs> which is it's just a marvelous idea. I mean, perhaps we'll eventually get to the point where we've got sort of a tourism trade for for the rest of the solar system which is which is kind of fun I think and it also shows that this is uh, this formation of these really really fine particles uh, is a quite a long-lived process um, because if it wasn't actually one of Saturn's rings the the ring called the e ring is actually formed from these ice crystals that are jettisoned off the surface of the moon the ones that don't fall back down float out into space and they eventually form the e ring of Saturn oh wow that's fascinating yeah yeah cool thank you all right and uh, now we'll move on to just chatting through some of the cyblogs posts this week uh, it was it was a pretty interesting week for science this week um, what with the Nobels and, and everything else and we'll talk a bit more about some of the everything else as well um, the first piece is a piece from the forensic scientist blog written by Anna and in fact uh, it's titled unanswered questions for Brent and David Tong and um, Anna Sanford has released a book called expert witness uh, which she's written which talks about forensic science and and her work in it and Brent and David Tong uh, I had a couple of questions for her about the book. And the first one is, uh, does forensic science only refer to science used for court cases, or are there other forms of investigation to which it pertains? And her answer is basically that forensic relates specifically to courts. But then she talks a little bit about sort of um, some of her criteria for uh, uh, admitting anything to court and, and what she deems is appropriate or not. And then the other one is, do you follow the outcomes of the cases you've worked on? Asks David Tong. Do you ever think the judge, jury, or counsel have totally misunderstood you? 
And Anna answers that she, as an expert witness, is there to serve the court, not specifically to serve one side or the other. So all she needs to do is, is make herself understood. Now, she says sometimes it is a little bit difficult to know whether one has been understood, but you can also tell. Um, there have been examples where, for example, the court and the jury have clearly understood a point that she's making, and the lawyers have not, and the court's told the lawyers to just get on with it and move on to the next question. Um, apparently, in England and Wales, it would be very, very rare to be advised of the outcome of a case unless it was reported in the media. But she says here in New Zealand, uh, barristers are more likely to let expert witnesses know the outcome, and also that expert witnesses should be notified if a case goes to appeal, because they may well be um, required for it. So, so interesting to know sort of about some of the due process, I guess, around being a forensic scientist. Oh, okay, that's really, really interesting. Hmm.